Okay, welcome back. It's time for another week of uh, astronomy and some new topics to consider. <clears throat> Excuse me. The project for this week is about the terrestrial and Jovian planets. I think this one is much more straightforward. I hope you find that it is a bit of a relief compared to the last two, which were both basically observational projects. This one is more of a research project. And uh, what I want you to do is to identify two planets. One planet should be a terrestrial planet, a so-called Earth-like planet, and the other planet should be a Jovian planet, a so-called Jupiter-like planet. But you're not allowed to choose the Earth for your terrestrial planet, and you're not allowed to choose Jupiter as your Jovian planet. So you have to, you can pick of the three other terrestrial planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, or the three other Jovian planets, uh, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. And uh, you can, uh, what I want you to do is to write a research paper, basically, that compares and contrasts these four planets with one another. So it's going to be a four-way comparison. <clears throat> and just to give it some structure, I'd like you to focus on four different aspects. Uh, atmosphere, magnetic field, orbital characteristics, and moons and rings. So, um, let's see atmosphere. Uh, the, the book doesn't dwell on the atmosphere. It, it talks a little bit about each of the atmospheres, but it doesn't exactly dwell on any of them. So what I wanted to do was to point out that you could look up, uh, using the wonderful tool Google, you could planetary atmos atmosphere, um, <clears throat> gravity, and temperature. The thing I want you to get is that the atmosphere that exists on a planet depends on two factors which are uh, basically fighting one another. <clears throat> one is temperature. The hotter the planet, the faster the gas molecules move, and the more easily they fly off into space. On the other hand, there's gravity. So if you've got a lot of gravity, then uh, the escape velocity is higher, and even though you have a high temperature, molecules might not be able to escape. The other thing you need to understand is that lighter molecules move faster than heavier molecules. So there's a mathematical relationship between the speed a molecule has at a given temperature and its mass. So on the Earth, for example, we have oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, but we have virtually no hydrogen or helium. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that hydrogen and helium are both very light, and at the temperatures you find on the, in the Earth's atmosphere, those gases move so fast, they go faster than the escape velocity, or at least a certain, a, a large enough fraction of them go faster than the escape velocity that over time they all uh, leave. So that's the idea there. So, but uh, you can, even though the book doesn't have a lot of material regarding this particular topic, you can find uh, a lots of material on the internet that describes the relationship. The other one, it basically I just described the relationship, but you can get more information about that relationship. Uh, the other one was moons and rings, so I'd like you to look up um, the so-called Roche limit and its effect on planetary rings. So there's a lot of material about that. I will describe briefly what's going on. <clears throat> it turns out that in addition to the gravitational force that acts on a planet that's orbiting a, an, uh, excuse me, in addition to the gravitational force that acts on a satellite that's orbiting a planet, for example, it turns out the gravitational force varies with distance so that on the near side of the satellite, the gravitational force is slightly stronger than it is on the far side of the satellite. So there's an actual variation in gravitational force per unit mass as you go from one end of the satellite to the other. And that difference is called the tidal force. It's that difference that produces the effect of the tides on the Earth. It's that difference that causes the moon, which is uh, slightly, slightly non-spherical, slightly elongated, uh, to always face the Earth because the tidal force locks it in its uh, rotational speed, is locked with its orbit speed, so that its one face always faces the Earth. 
Well, the Roche limit basically points out that if you adjust the distance between a satellite and its planet, the <clears throat> tidal forces grow at a faster rate than the gravitational forces. The gravitational forces go like 1 over r squared. The tidal force turns out goes like 1 over r cubed. It goes like the uh, slope of the gravitational force, or the rate of change of the gravitational force with distance, and it turns out that goes like 1 over r cubed. And so as something gets closer and closer to its uh, central planet, as the satellite gets closer and closer to its planet, the tidal forces at some point will grow larger than the gravitational forces that hold the thing together in the first place. So the moon, for example, is held together primarily by gravitational force, and that will become unstable. So the thing will no longer be held together, it will break apart, and so there's a minimum distance you have to be away from the planet in order to be gravitationally stable. If you get closer than that, that's inside the Roche limit, you're unstable, and that has a lot to do with the fact that Saturn and these other large gas giants have significant rings. So there's that one. Um, let's see, what else did I have here? Atmospheres, oh, magnetic field. Okay, so, um, same idea. The book doesn't have a lot to say about it. Planetary magnetic fields. There you can go and look at uh, the magnetic fields of different planets, and, and the point is this. Magnetic fields are produced by electrical currents. In order for a planet to produce an electrical current, it needs to be rotating, first of all, and it needs to have some kind of conducting inner core. So the fact that a planet has a magnetic field tells you something about its internal structure. And so there are uh, lots of sources here you can go and read about that, but that's the main idea. I'd like you to look at the magnetic fields of your planet, your planets, the two you choose, and the Earth and Jupiter, and make a comparison between these magnetic fields and see what you can learn from that about the internal structure of these guys. And what was the last thing? Let's see. Oh, orbital characteristics. So that you can get from the book. It basically just talks about uh, what is the time it takes to go around, how far is it from the sun, how long does it take to rotate once on its axis. Each of these planets have uh, slightly different values. So you know a little bit about that from the earlier chapters. But they all, or at least several of them, have some fi fairly unique characteristics, and I'd like you to uh, look into that. So for the planets you choose, look into that, see what you can discover. If you choose Mercury, I want to point out that Mercury also has a kind of tidal locking, but it's not exactly the same as the tidal locking for the Moon. So uh, if you don't, there's not much in the book about that, but if you choose Mercury, do a little research on the, the orbital um, tidal locking of Mercury. Okay, so I think that's about it. Let me see, is there anything else I need to say? Uh, at this point, I don't think so. Oh, the business of references. I need you to uh, use two different references besides the book. You're welcome to refer to the book if you want to. The thing is, uh, the book doesn't talk about some of these things very well, so as you're going through these guys, make sure that you specify where you got your information. And I'd like one of the references, at least, to be a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And the question is, well, how the heck do I get one of those guys? And the answer is, um, you go to Google Scholar. At least this is one way to do it. They're not the only way to do it. Go to Google Scholar, which focuses on peer-reviewed journals. We don't need patents. And uh, you could say, for example, look at planetary atmosphere, something like that. And you get a bunch of uh, <clears throat> planetary atmosphere. Some of these guys have PDFs. So you can click on the PDF, and you get the full text of the thing. So uh, you can search on Google Scholar. A lot of the articles are going to be from commercial journals that will, you know, you'd have to pay to get the thing, but there are going to be some, at least, that are uh, free. So I would focus on those, obviously. There's no point in spending money on this. And uh, if you have any questions or anything seems unclear, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. We'll see you guys soon.